tonight for our second online artist talk. Uh, we're very excited to have with us Lynn Lisberger and Myron Beasley, uh, both of whom share a common have been uh, professors and curators. Uh, we're standing here in Lynn Lisberger's current exhibition, Gravity. Uh, the exhibition consists of work from two of her series, Who's the Victim and Ladder and Bridge, both of which I'm sure we'll be learning more about over the course of the evening. Um, you can hopefully see behind me, uh, Lynn Lisberger is a sculptor, primarily a wood carver. Uh, she was an instructor of sculpture, drawing, and 3D design at the University of Southern Maine for over 30 years. Last year, she curated the beautiful show on books at the Lewis Gallery at the Portland Public Library. Uh, her work has been shown at uh, galleries throughout Maine, as well as in shows at both USM's Center for Book Arts and Atrium Gallery, the Center for Maine Contemporary Arts, the Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens and Maine Alban Society, ICA at Maine College of Art, the University of New England, West Carolina University, Radford University, and Albany Institute of History and Art. Lindsberger has had uh, residencies in Hugh Oaks, Cambridge Center for Creative Arts, Morse High School in Bath, and Watershed Center for the Ceramic Arts. Uh, she was also a Full White Scholar finalist. Uh, you may have noticed in that introduction several uh, mentions of books. Uh, it's probably because Lynn uh, received her undergraduate degree in literature before going on to the University of Pennsylvania for her MFA in sculpture. Uh, Byron Beasley is a scholar and international curator. He is associate professor of American studies at Bates College, where he also serves on the Committee of Gender and Sexuality Studies. His ethnographic research includes exploring the intersection of cultural politics, art, and social change, as he believes in the power of artists and recognizes them as cultural workers. Myron is also on board of our good friend and neighbor, Indigo Arts Alliance. He has been awarded fellowships and grants by the Andy Warhol Foundation, the Whiting Foundation, National Endowment for the Humanities, the Kindling Fund, the Davis Family Foundation, the Ruth Landis Award from the Reed Foundation, and most recently, Dorothea and Leo Rapkin Foundation for his ethnographic writing about art and cultural engagement. Some of his recent curatorial projects here in Maine include Repast, Remembering Malaga, that took place on Malaga Island, Print Protest Poster, which was here in Portland at Abel Baker Gallery. Uh, farther afield, uh, Myron's curatorial projects have included exhibitions at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, in Dakar, Senegal, Paris, France, and in Haiti. His writing has appeared in many academic journals, including Liminalities, the Journal of Performance Studies, the Journal of Poverty, Text and Performance Quarterly, Museum and Social Issues, the Journal of Curatorial Studies, Performance Research, and Gastronomica, the Journal of Food and Culture. So without further ado, I turn it over to Lynn and Myron. Well, good evening, and uh, it's so nice to be able to be here to, to engage in this conversation with you, Lynn. Thank and you. I want to also thank Cove Street Art Center for whom created this amazing space in Portland for amazing contemporary art and culture. And so Lynn, yes. this is a, an amazing show. Thank you. And it's uh, such an honor to be invited to have this conversation with you. And uh, it's always uh, meaningful to engage with such an esteemed artist. And I'm just curious first about the concept of gravity and the title of your show. Well, you know, the concept gravity luckily has many, many interpretations yeah, or meanings. Yeah. So it obviously has to do with that sense of things falling. Mm. But it also has gravitas or something, that sort of sense of seriousness. So weighty in the sense of having um, some kind of so, something to ponder. So I actually think this show, I didn't come up with the title of this show. I think Diamond did, who works here. And we were all sitting around a table saying, what should we title this? What should we title this? And Diamond goes, how about gravity? And I was like, bingo. This was perfect. Yeah. Because these, so these two series of pieces, really the latter pieces are very much about sort of going contrary to gravity in the sense of rising up and how, what you do, how your, how the process of your life carries you in a trajectory that is hopefully not too heavily impacted by gravity. In other words, we don't want to fall off. Yeah. And 
the other, the, who's the victim pieces are very much about this concept of um, the weightiness of everybody's individual feelings. Hmm. So, and they came, I, I know we were talking about this, they came very much out of Trump's election. And my realization that I, mean, I felt incredibly victimized by that. And then I started reading and discovered that the people who, there were people who felt victimized who were on the other side of my point of view. And I thought, well, wait a minute. If everybody feels like the victim, then we have to discuss this. Wow. And, and so that really brought me to wow. that, to That's these amazing. pieces. So now how does this show configures in your entire, your, your history of art making, for example. I mean, there's a progression, or um, is it the, your, how does it fit into the history of what you've been producing throughout the years? You know, I, there was a point in time when I realized I, could, I can do many things. I can cast bronze, I can carve stone, yeah. I can weld poorly, but I can yeah, weld. Yeah. Um, and I realized I really loved carving wood. I like what wood does. I like how it feels. I like how forgiving it is. There are all these things that, so that made me decide I'm a wood carver. I, the other thing I like about wood is that you can take it away and you can put it back together. I mean, in other words, you have the reductive and the additive mm. ability all, all at the same time. And so, that's part of what makes it forgiving and also part of what makes it fun. Oh, that's interesting. Because I want to go back to the concept of gravity mm -hmm. and the heaviness, yeah. right? And I appreciate the understanding of the heaviness of what's happening culturally and our politics mm -hmm. and our everyday lives and so forth. And when I think of wood, I do think of that kind of heaviness. But when I walked through this show, I was amazed with the fluidity and the performative nature of, of, of your wood carvings, right? Uh, there's this uh, great theorist, um, Barbara Gershwin Black Gimlet, mm -hmm. who said that objects have a life of their own, right? The, the objects are sort of performative. And then when I look at the balloon over there, mm -hmm. the hand, I mean, it's just so smooth, it looks almost real, right? And so the suggestion of heaviness is almost transparent or translucent, right? Or yeah. Well, it's a little, it's sort, I've always, I always try, first of all, I am an object maker. I love objects. I'm not, I mean, in the sense of how we relate to them, so they're very, they're, they're so intimately involved with our bodies. Mm. But, now I'm forgetting what I was going to say, but something about the way that um, I'm lost. No, that's okay. What so there was a, I wanted to ask you more about the, your, your, your statement about the intimacy of the body, that the wood, the carving, or the objects itself that you make, and this, this interplay between the human, the body, right. and the creation of things. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think part of what you were talking about was touch, and that sense of touch, oh. wow. right? And, and I think that, so, and for me, that's the act of the hand. And so when I'm carving, my hands are fully engaged. And when I'm, th when, when I'm thinking about surface, I'm thinking about hands. I think a lot, though, about the tension mm. that goes between the beauty of a surface, the beauty of a piece of wood, the, the kind of loveliness that you can get out of wood, and in contrast to the and this is where the heaviness comes in, in contrast to the things that come very viscerally from us. So I'm, sometimes I'm really successful in getting that sense of viscera, or not, I don't want to say the word angst, I, I mean it's just like something from the gut. And at the same time, there's something, uh, I, I hope that comes from the heart that has to do with the, the touch of wood 
or the feel of wood or the feel of the objects. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so there's the heavy and the light mm. going together. Mm. So you early alluded to this concept of, you, did you say you were a maker? Yes. You used the term making a maker. Is that to juxtapose as a quote unquote artist or fine artist? Or no, no, no. Crafts person mm. or? Oh, that's so interesting. No, I, I think that all artists have craft in what they do, and some pay attention differently to craft from others. Mm -hmm. And also, when not everybody makes things. Some people, I mean, the whole idea of conceptual art is as legitimately an art as carving a balloon, right? So my way of expressing my ideas has to do with making. But hopefully I'm getting past, I mean, that this is the, this is the place that sort of, for me, the crux of making art is how do you get to this point that isn't just about the making, but what inspires the making and what, mm. what evolves from the making. I don't know quite the right words, but so the making for me is that pivotal point. Okay. So the ideas come together in this form or object or act of making, mm. and then some idea emerges. Right. And so you, you did attend to this notion of why you enjoyed working with wood. Mm -hmm. But what inspires you to do the work that you do? Oh, man. So I used to say that I should have been a poet because, well, first of all, I wouldn't have to lug this stuff around and all my tools <laughs> and store it, but because I really like language a lot. But I thought I'm, language is sort of too easy for me. And I, I don't think poetry is easy, but I thought, I always felt that language was too easy. And so I thought if I took a step away from language and, and put myself in a position where I had to speak with form, yeah. that that would be a, a better way of making an expression. And I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope yeah. it does. Yeah. So, um, why I make sculpture in wood, it's partly it's a habit, you know, I've been doing it for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but for 30 years, and it, again, it was looping back to, to gravity. Yeah. And uh, the impetus for the show, and actually for the, the, your arc of 30 years yeah. of, of making. Yes. Um, and I didn't know if there was like one overarching philosophical thought that, oh, the body of my work is simply about blank. No, you know, or, it's interesting. The body of my work sort of has had parallel paths. Yeah. yeah so yeah. that one... And it's, I'm not suggesting that it's one thing, no, no. by the way, right? It's, no. It's ups and downs and it's nuanced and, okay. Right, but so sometimes I'm really talking about my relationship to nature. And I lived for 30 years in the woods in Gorham, and I was very, very close to being of the land. And on the other hand, I cared deeply about causes and things. So I, while I have sometimes this work that's very responsive to nature, I have other work that's very responsive to politics. I wouldn't call it political art, but, I mean, I think, unless you want to call this political art, uh, but um, it is certainly driven by my concern about politics or my concern about human beings. So mm -hmm. there's nature and there's humans. And then there's the figure has fit in there every once in a while, you know? <laughs> so, um, so where does gravity fit in? And sort of an overall idea? It, goes probably back to that, the two things that gravity is very much an element of nature and then gravitas 
for me is that sort of seriousness and how do it, how do I say how I can't change things much as I would like to I mean little things but so how do I speak about them how do I speak about the things that I want to change okay well I think they would think that we have the power to change things yes. and even you know Durser told this great theorist says even a, a walk a walk through space mm -hmm. is a revolutionary act in so many regards and you know, I want us to think about politics much more holistically. Mm -hmm. And just uh, that walk is a political statement. So everything I'm, I could be considered. Yes. Politics, right? Yeah. You know, I'm just right. a I, way of sort of teasing some of these elements out because I'm interested in how what you might, how you might feel to have your work in a gallery space. Well, first of all, this is a gorgeous space. It is a gorgeous space. So, I mean, it feels good physically to be in here. It mm -hmm. has high ceilings and they're wood <laughs> and it's, this, you know, but it's always wonderful to get work out of the studio because, mm -hmm. and when we were planning this, Kelly said to me, okay, it's going to be a very spare looking show. She said, I'm a little nervous about it, but it's going to be very spare. And I said, don't worry, it will be fine. And to, but to get these things so that they have breath around them, you don't get breath in the studio. Okay. You have things, at least I don't. Some people have spacious enough studios, and maybe they can yeah. get a little bit of breath. But I don't have breath in my studio, it, that kind of exhibition breath. Yeah, okay. And I have, I have plenty of space in my studio to work, but things get sort of pushed up against each other and maybe one idea is, you know, one group of pieces is here and there's another group of pieces here. To have them out like this and then to have them in juxtaposition to these ladder pieces. So I do think that the ladders describe space in a very different way. Yeah. These sort of a space occupies them, yeah, mm -hmm. but the ladders, to me, describe space. Mm -hmm. So I like those two sort of juxtapositions of yeah. what it means to consider space. And so what do you want us to see when we come into it? What do you want us to experience when we walk into this space? Oh, I, I could throw that question back at you. Yeah. 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 What, I mean, Lots of things, but what do you experience? What does what do you experience? You know, when, you when I walk through here, I, I walked through the show a couple of times. The first, the initial time, um, I tried not to think about the title of the show, mm -hmm. and I was taken aback with the movement of the objects, and I and the sharp for me sharp juxtaposition between the ladders and the other pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was drawn to the ladders because for me it sort of meant this notion of movement and mm -hmm. wanting to step on them, wanting to touch them. They were much more inviting in that way because yes. I think they're all inviting. Yeah. But I also equally wanted to touch those balloons I know. <laughs> because they looked so real and fluid. And I love the thought and I really appreciate the comment that you made about your attention to wood because it's forgiving, you know? And I also think of wood, you know, I think of wood and nature to bodies as this, this um, material that is so strong and hard, seemingly, but yet it is a, it's a softness, right, um, to it. And the strands are like the veins of mm -hmm. you know, living and life that we have in our own bodies. So I felt a sense of awe when I walked through the space. Oh, nice. And, uh, and totally engaged, and I like the spaciousness, because I don't think it's really, it's open, but it's, there's a lot going on in this space. And it allowed me to contemplate. Oh, good. So yeah. it wasn't an overabundance of objects here that it allowed me the space and the time to dwell and to contemplate what was happening. Yeah. That's nice. Well, I think, so. I think that that works that way for me. It helps that, that, that Roy, who sets up these shows, is brilliant yeah. at doing that. So he has an understanding of that kind of spatial 
how how to make the the space breathe. Mm -hmm. But um, I I also think that the color as opposed usually I don't I'm not a painter. No, I'm the first to admit. <laughs> I always said to my students, I know enough about color to know that I don't know enough about color. Yeah. But wood, luckily, has a color of its own that mm. is that, and it just carries itself however it wants. And so I don't usually I use hardwoods only, um, partly because the grain is tighter, and that has something to do with the color. Yeah, okay. I actually think so that that there's a kind of density or to the surface that it has not just the obvious wood density, but it has a color kind of density. So that if something is a brown, it's a brown, but it's a very rich brown. Or if something mm -hmm. is sort of mm -hmm. a tan, it's a rich tan. And um, th when the grain is further apart on softwoods, you see much more of the grain. And I'm less interested in the grain most of the time. I see. Um, except when it when I'm fighting it, and then I <laughs> then I want to have nothing to do with it. But um, another thing that's sort of interesting to know is I don't I like to I work the surface of my wood with tools, and I like to create a surface that the tool the mark of the tool is very important. And but these balloons had to be smooth. It's so aggravating. <laughs> it's like wow. I have to sand these things. I don't want to sand them. I really, I like the surface. That that's one reason I like wood. I like the mark that the tool makes mm. on wood. Mm. So, um, yeah. but so I. But I, the balloons needed to be smooth. Mm. I mean, that's. There's, a, there's two more questions, and one mm -hmm. is that I just wanted to. The, the impetus for that previous question about the space mm -hmm. and what you wanted us to engage with or how did you want us to feel mm -hmm. was more about how did you see these objects performing in this space juxtaposed to your studio because these objects look totally different or there's a different feel or a different engagement mm -hmm. in a space like this versus the space in the studio. Right. And I just wondered if like, you saw a stark difference. Um, you looked at them differently, or you saw something? The biggest difference, actually, is, uh, has to do with the times that we're in. So these oh. pieces, I mean, I think of these as very existential pieces. Yes, yeah, they are. Yeah, I get it. But we are not in an existential time. So to, to have gone from them in my studio as this, who's the victim? And, Hopefully, all of them give you the answer of, I'm not sure, I think everybody, right? That's, yeah, yeah. or nobody, I'm not sure which. Um, to come in here and then think, why am I asking who's the victim? Because it's pretty clear cut in these times where the victims are. I mean, we have a lot going on. Yep, absolutely. And so it maybe is a different, it's, like a different idea of victimization or mm. a victim, but so that was maybe the biggest leap. If I had taken these out of the studio two years ago and put them on the wall, I might have had a different feeling about Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Absolutely. But so now they now they feel a little um, more distant to me uh, than they might have wow. before. Amazing. Absolutely. This notion of time and space and the objects, amazing. Yeah. I mean, culturally. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So as a professor, yes. I think I have to sneak in one of the, these pedagogical questions. So what do you say to young artists, uh, st someone who wants to go to school to study art? Mm -hmm. What do you say to inspire them? Or to encourage them? Yeah. Well, it's not a very encouraging world right now for artists or mm -hmm. maybe for anybody. But I, do, I think that people who want to make art want to make art. And there's not much you can do to thwart that feeling. Now, some of us are fortunate enough to be able to do it. 
and do it full time, mm. or at least with, when I was teaching, obviously not. But uh, since I'm no longer teaching, I have the opportunity to be in the studio whenever I yeah. want. But I always say to my students, find a way to get, uh, they, very often they come in wanting to make a kind of art or having a kind of, oh, I'm going to be this kind of artist. And I really work hard to teach them how to, how to get past expectation, not, not expectations, but having made decisions before mm. anything is learned. And one thing, I, as a teacher, I always taught technique. I said, if you know how to make something, then at least you aren't fighting with that process of making, right? You know how to put the paint on the canvas, you know how to mix paints, you know something about color, mm -hmm. you know how to carve wood, you know how to sharpen your tools, you know how to weld. All of these things are really important in order to be able to express yourself. So I think that being an artist is a form of expression that this society is in, always in dire need of. Yes, yeah. And what I say, what I also, also say to my students is that sometimes being an artist is not making art, but it's being creative in whatever you decide to do. And so, you know, I mean, you can be creative as a mathematician and you can be creative as an electrician and you can be creative as a, a coder, or you can be creative. There's so many ways to be creative and so, um, and I taught at USM, so it's a very different group of students who are coming from a pretty different place from maybe a private art school or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So I could talk about practicalities and creativity without sounding sort of snobby or anything like that. Yeah. Does that answer? What do you say to students? Because you talk about yeah. art in a, in a sort of more performative way, well, right? I, mm -hmm. But I also look at art, you know, as a, I look at artists and when I write about them as cultural workers. Mm -hmm. And they're the theorist of any moment, of any time. And I'm reminded of James Baldwin's amazing essay um, about artists are uh, disturbers of the peace, right? right? So artists are called on in these moments and uh, ways of which they articulate, I mean, artists have ways of articulating these heightened political abstract concepts to everyday people in ways that a college professor may not be able to, right. or a politician. And so for me, I look at artists as amazing theorists and well, cultural uh, yeah. workers to evoke change in our, oh, in our society. And, and they're always at the head of the, of the yeah, the yeah. whatever that phalanx of yes, energy absolutely. and so and I also always said to my students because I often taught students who weren't going to be artists but yep. were taking art classes as a minor or because they yeah. loved doing it or because they had to take an art class I mean even them yeah. and I'd say I want you to understand that you don't have to be an artist but you have to support artists and so I always used it sort of as a little bit of a bully pulpit to say Okay, buy art, you know, make art, buy art, <laughs> love your fellow artists, whatever it might be, but don't, don't ever dismiss artists as Absolutely. something ex, ex, beyond, outside of the norm. Yeah. So. so should we check to see if there's any questions um, coming from the web world uh, that we could engage? Okay. One question when uh, is uh, a lot of this work looks like you were literally making it the day before the exhibition because it's so timely. Um, but one piece in particular was clearly made right before the exhibition, which is uh, the one I'm standing next to out here, the guns piece. Right. Uh, I guess the question is uh, were you already planning a who's the victim uh, piece? related to guns and then it morphed into encompassing the pandemic or was this completely new during the pandemic with the guns? No, the, the guns were in my mind 
all along. Um, not because there's any question of who the victim is when somebody is behind a gun as opposed to being in front of it. I think it's pretty clear, except that, I mean, my feeling is, first of all, very deeply that this, that if we got rid of guns, a lot of our problems right now mm -hmm. would be gone. But, um, so everybody knows where my politics are in case you're wondering. The COVID virus for that particular piece, I really wanted to have a gun with a balloon. And I thought, oh, a gun blowing up a balloon. And then I thought, that looks like a bubblegum type of machine. And I hated that. And so the virus definitely came uh, partly because it worked. But to have the other gun there, which was part of the question, was like, do I have one gun with the virus or do I have two? And I, I like that idea. First of all, one of those guns is sort of from the wild, wild west type mm -hmm. of old pistol. One is a semi-automatic uh, pistol. So they're out of different times. What would happen if one was confronting the other? What happens when you put this virus in between or yeah. whatever. So I think it creates a sense of um, fear and, mm. and, and also maybe it's a little bit humorous. Okay. I, I hope all of this has a slight humorous edge to it, even though I don't think guns are funny. But, but how, how has this moment uh, impacted your art making? This COVID moment. Yeah, this, the COVID moment is different from this racial justice moment. Yeah, mm -hmm. So the COVID moment, except that they're obviously deeply connected. The COVID moment made me realize, well, I was able, I was able to go to the studio every day because I didn't have to, my studio space is something I don't have to oh. interact with other people. So that gave me the, chance to make art that was about, I, a lot of artists have done this, about that desperation mm -hmm. of, you know, fear and you don't know what it is and you don't know who has it, all of that stuff. And then as we watched people getting sicker and we watched who was getting sicker and who was dying, it was desperation. And I know a lot of artists who didn't get into the studio at all. Yeah because they were so desperate. And I was, it took me a long time to start making stuff. Oh, uh -huh. okay. I was drawing every day, and then I started drawing on wood. So I started drawing on little pieces of wood, um, using what I had at hand. So mm. it makes, it, it sort of puts you in a slightly different place where um, you use what's at hand. So it makes you more resourceful. I'd say that that's a little bit of what's happened with this, like, okay, I'm not going, I'm not gallivanting about <laughs> to find wood or to travel to, inf you know, inform my next pieces. I'm staying here and I'm using what I have. The racial justice stuff, that's just terrifying. Well, that was actually another question that I wanted to raise, uh, the racial justice aspect. Because you also have this piece, uh, uh, Who's the Victim Boot? Yes. Out here, which obviously, which is for people who haven't seen it, is a boot that's stepping upon a hand. Mm -hmm. um, and that again is something that's obviously become very timely, uh, which perhaps would have had a different meaning when you I don't know if it had a different meaning when you were making it. It has come to represent something entirely different now. But uh, could you speak a bit about that? Yeah, well, you're right. It started out sort of as this idea of how do you deal with a bully um, in the more abstract sense. And I think that that's probably of all the pieces, uh, although I know people who think the water balloon piece is sort of making referencing mm -hmm. things very close at hand, too. Um, that, has, that probably has become the most significant statement of, of that feeling of desperation, but um, it still holds. My, I, my thought when I made that is, if you step on my hand, I will lift it up. In other words, you cannot squash me 
I will throw you, you know, that sort of sense, even though I don't have any martial arts skills. But that's, you know, in my mind, lots of things happen <laughs> that don't happen in real life. But so yes, that's probably in many ways the most effective at talking about mm -hmm. that, the whole issue of racial justice right now. So we've got a question from Diana. Uh, how has, been, how is, has being an artist in the Portland community of makers changed your art in specific ways? Oh, Diana. Um, I, ha I probably, several people in this community and I actually all went to the same graduate school at University of Pennsylvania. And so we come, we came out of a program and several of the people came out from Colby too where Harriet Matthews taught for years. So it was, there was sort of a, I didn't go to Colby, but this idea of how you make objects and how you, not how you make objects, but how your, how your hand is engaged and the importance of that is probably pretty deeply connected. And when I think about the people who I taught with at USM and the people who came out of UPenn who are sculptors who are still friends of mine, Duncan Hewitt, for instance, is one who um, most people at least know of, I would say that it, it is a, we are a deeply connected community on, a, on some levels. There's, and so there's a kind of nurturing and it's a love of making. And if you look around, I mean, you look at what Lauren Fensterstock does, you look at what Aaron Stefan does, you, I'm trying to think of a million people, you think of what Edouise Charlot used to do when she was here. I mean, there, people are just thinking about the, I think the thingness that is so heartwarming mm. about having your hands in something. Mm. And we're, we're all in it together. That's one thing that I'm pretty sure of. There's no, nothing is, there's no sense of cutthroat at all. And mm. so there's a lot of support. We've got a question from Jody here, which I think could be taken in several different ways. Uh-oh. Uh, but I'll let you, I'll just, I'll read the question and let you uh, answer it as, as you wish. Uh, what has been the most difficult sculpture for you to make? So this is my sister who's asking this, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, Put you on the spot. Yeah. The hard, I think the most difficult for me, physically, the stuff that's physically difficult can be hard. So I'm a small person. I'm working alone in the studio, so there is a kind of scale thing going on. Otherwise, I, don't, I can't really say that there's something that's, that's difficult except for trying to make sure that I don't get into things too pretty, right? I mean, I, I tend to the pretty, so, I, so the most difficult thing is to stay as close as I can to some edge. If that makes there, sense. Has, has there been any particular series or work where you had a concept in mind but it was just really difficult to realize it? No, I I'm a sort of I'm a doer. So if I if I make something if I think of something it I can carry it out. It isn't always <laughs> successful, but I can at least do it. So that's part of the <laughs> goal. So we've got uh, question here from Emily who comments that you have a wonderful sense of humor and a sense of whimsy in many of your pieces. Uh, what do you think keeps that humor or whimsy in your work? And what do you think uh, your darkest body of work or series of pieces has been? Um, well, you know, in my family, I'm not sure any of us has a brilliant sense of humor, but so that's partly our sense of humor. <laughs> Is that, but I, if you don't keep things light, you're in trouble, right, at some point. And so for me, that's been really important. Sort of it balances against the depressive times. And there have been a lot of them. I mean, I think being a human being has moments of depression. 
Probably my most political pieces were a series of pieces that came out of the Rwandan genocide. And um, those pieces were carved and coated in lime. And they were of, of a lot of the people who had been um, slaughtered and left in a particular schoolhouse in Rwanda and their bodies just became desiccated. And the uh, doctor actually who was studying AIDS went to Rwanda and took all these photographs of these. And that, those, those, that group of pieces was probably the, my toughest in that sense. And, um, and they were, there was something about that white lime and I used some gray lime too. Mm -hmm. So they had this really ghastly and ghostly mm -hmm. quality to them. And they were carved out of a single piece of wood mm -hmm. and with a chainsaw so that, it, so there was a kind of roughness, a real, um, so that's the viscera yeah. again, yeah. Wow. More questions? But that also goes back to this, the artist as a cultural worker. So, and that was your language. Right. Those were your words. I mean, that was your natural response to that atrocity, right? Right. That's the amazing. pictures were really striking. I mean, and beautiful in their own, mm. I mean, not, not lovely. Yes, yes. But beautiful okay. because of the shapes of the forms. We do have a screen. There's a lot of uh, question marks here. What no sense of humor from your sister, but I don't think that's an actual question. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the numerous question marks. <laughs> uh, one thing I, I found fascinating when I went to your studio and saw the, saw the pile of wood in the corner, mm -hmm. um, I was hoping you could talk a bit about uh, just how you source wood and where you get it, because I thought that was interesting. Well, I actually believe in using wood as locally sourced as possible. And so I've carved pieces from when they redid Fort Allen Park and they cut down the cedar trees. I got some of those cedar trees and I got some of the apple, there were crab apple trees. And so when I lived in Gorham, I was surrounded by woods and I had an orchard and so there was this constant source. I have really good friends in Gorham who still are occasionally losing plum trees and the like, and so those come into it. A lot of these pieces have been carved from chestnut. Um, there was a chestnut tree right behind our house here in Portland, I mean literally in the yard behind us, and they cut that down but to everybody's great chagrin, and they built a big ugly house in its place, which was even worse, but um, <laughs> Maybe it isn't so ugly, but it's big. And, but he gave me some of that chestnut. And so I've been carving wood from my backyard here, which is really nice. And then some other friends in Gorham had their neighbor cut down their chestnut tree, and I already knew that chestnut was. And then like these, the boats, the walnut boats in this latter piece came from, oops, I had some friends who were building a condo a series of condos and they wanted and they had to cut down a walnut tree in order to do it. It was a down on the west end. It wasn't very far. They said, "Will you carve us mantel pieces?" And so I carved the mantel pieces and then had walnut left over to carve. But so I get wood from very close by and people will say to me, "Lynn, Lynn, I've got a <laughs> I've got an apple tree that fell down, or I've got a this or that. And I must have like a big target on my back that says, you know, give me a piece of wood, whatever you do. <laughs> I have my limits, and now that I'm upstairs in a studio instead of downstairs, I can't get, get everything. I see, right. right. So it sits outside a lot. But. I was actually wondering if you could talk a bit about the boats in the ladder and bridge series. Because I think, you know, just looking at the pieces, obviously the ladder and bridge are evident from the structure itself. Right. But uh, if you could speak a bit about how the boats fit in. Well, you know, I think I've always been interested in vessels. And I think that's because our bodies yes. are vessels. So that's the bottom line to it. And also, I, I feel very much that this gesture of bringing people to you is a 
sort of vessel type of thing. But um, these really started when my son went off to college. So he, uh, I realized he could have made different choices and the choices he made set him off on a certain journey. And, and I like the idea of thinking that we don't know what's happening next. And I also like the idea of thinking that you're gonna come upon something in an odd or awkward place. So, you know, so what, so, uh, you know, we don't know if we're underwater at some point and coming to the surface of water, or if, you know, the water has fallen away and the boat's been thrown upon it. Um, but, it, so it's, I, I do believe in narrative really, really strongly, but I also believe in the abstraction of narrative. Mm. So that I'm not saying this happened and that happened and therefore that happened. I'm saying, oh, you know, there, I thought about journeys and I realized that things trip you up or hoist you up or whatever and that it gives you the opportunity to go somewhere else. So with these, you know, you can go from one boat to the next. It's sort of, don't, you know, don't stop here. Let this be a bridge type of thing. Mm -hmm. We've got a question here from Molly. Mm -hmm. uh, since you've been um, doing art for a long time and now seem to be in an especially creative time, what do you attribute that to? Um, I think it's just time, the oppor time and opportunity. And um, I, I think I've always been in it. I think I've always been creative in many ways, but I do have more time to go to the studio now. And um, so that's probably it more than anything. Let's see if anybody else has any questions. Do you have any more questions? No, I think this is great. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm amazed with, <laughs> with all of the questions that are coming through. And, yes. Um, and equally, your stunning responses to them. Yeah. Good. Well, I do believe, I mean, I believe really strongly in trying to tell some kind of a story. And if that's change, as you said, everybody, every act is an act of yeah, change. Yeah, yeah then the ability to be able to tell a story, to be able to do it with wood, and to sort of create a story that other people can fill in with their own narrative. Absolutely. Is Absolutely. pretty important yeah. to me. So. Yeah. I think that's the last of the viewer questions. Okay. Good. Well, thank you, Myron, very much. Oh, that's it. thank you. No, and I just want to say that I love the fact of how you were able to tell stories oh. with these objects. You know, I love the story about the ladder oh, and your good. son. Yes. And those are beautiful narratives I think that many of us will take. Um, but it's also a way in which you, again, attend to this notion of wood and the humanness and the bodies and the nurturing elements of them. And so thank you so much for that. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming and watching, and all of my friends and siblings for asking good questions. <laughs>